of the best well-read, funny, warm, interesting people that you can find online. So Trump is like Segar and Jetty. For once, you're a guest, not a host. Andrew Schultz makes this comment about how we finally have Indians might be seen for what they are. I love Schultz. I've been friends with him for a couple of hours, I think two years. Man, this guy's a genius. Going after the Cubans, going after the Haitians. Rogan is one of those people I both count as like a friend and as somebody who has been enormously impactful on my own career. All of the comments were the same. They just, thank you for just treating Andrew Yang seriously. Hey, the president wants to talk to you. And I was like, okay. What? I love the hustle. Trust in the mainstream media. The more it goes down, the bigger your market. But try being black in Japan. I love America. Hello and welcome to the Good Time Show. And we have a treat for you today. We have Sagar and Jetty, co-host of Breaking Points, co-host of the Realignment Podcast, and honestly, one of the best well-read, funny, warm, interesting people that you can find online. If you've ever seen his content, you know how smart, savvy Sagar is on the current state of U.S. politics and just his like incredible political commentary. But it was also kind of a treat for us to talk for him to talk about what it was to be a White House press correspondent, uh, being in the Oval Office in the briefing room and. We just had so much fun just listening to him. We have crazy stories, meeting Trump, uh, doing a show with Rogan, with Lex Friedman, what it means to succeed online, uh, coffee debates. Yes, uh, uh, Europe. <laughs> uh, uh, woke, wokeism and cancel culture. Uh, just We just get into it all. And this was amazing. So Sagar and Jerry, enjoy. Hey, Sagar, welcome. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the invite. That was a interesting welcome. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just want to say, uh, and I mean this genuinely, as opposed to other times I say this, and sometimes I don't mean it genu genuinely. Yeah. It, it, which is like Sagar is really one of my favorite people on the internet and as a friend. Uh, you know, he's one of these people who makes you feel that you're dumb, but not in a bad way. So. Uh, you know, and, wow. uh, so uh, I just want to say Sagar is amazing. And this morning before we were doing the show, Sagar texts us and says, hey, do you want the full suit version of Sagar or do you want the casual Silicon Valley tech hipster nerd hoodie wearing <laughs> Sagar? I mean, we said casual, but we had a split second thought whether we should dress up in suits. And I would love that. <laughs> just I would to love mess that. with you. Yeah, it works for me. <laughs> oh my goodness! And, and I, but I just like that's your interpretation of casual, like yes. uh, right there. Uh, uh, it's a good look. It's a, it's working for you. It's a, it's a thank good look. you, thank you. That's like a Silicon Valley CEO look. Like that's kind of like nicely I know. done. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, listen, you guys know something uh, a little bit over there. I just look. It's out of respect for you, right? Which is like, it's like what uh, what vibe you want to go for, which. Uh, what topics, exploration, all of that. So it's about it's about what you want to project to the world. So it's like I'm your guest. I'm here to do whatever you whatever you want. For once, you're a guest, not a host. I know it's weird because um, what I want to do is turn everything around immediately. <laughs> like, well, let me let me help you get to that thought. Uh, uh, hold on, right? No seizing of power here yet. Okay, all right. Let's me get started at the very beginning, right? Like you know, I want to know how the Sagar and Jerry story started. Like when you know, 50 years from now, when somebody's writing a biography. What is the equivalent of the Hill People of Texas chapter for your story? Actually, it's quite similar, very geographical. I grew up in College Station, Texas, which is about 100 miles or so from where Lyndon Johnson um, also grew up. And look, I'm going to be honest, it was a strange childhood. My parents were professors. They're both from South India. Um, uh, they were teaching at Texas A&M. And the U.S. was in a very transitional time. So I was born in 1992. But my first political memory is of the 2000 election. Prior to that, I actually remember my mom got her Ph.D. And I actually met George W. Bush when he was the wow. governor. He shook my mom's hand when he gave her the diploma. So I was like vaguely aware and at the center of these things in a strange way. And 9-11 just changed my entire life. It, it was the true demarcation point for me because I do and I genuinely do remember at least the vibe of what a I would call like a pre racially conscious America and look before everybody jumps down my throat I'm talking in the brown context not in the different context so I just remember what it was like to grow up in that place and then I remember the day after 9-11 September 12 2001 and it just changed everything about living in that town and this is uncomfortable for some of the people who I grew up with and I don't blame them uh, it's really not their fault it's mostly their parents but 
there's just no question that there was a kind of an ostracization and kind of, uh, I don't know, there was an igniting of a vibe that was just different. It was bad. Uh, as a child, you're trying to make sense of these things. I was only, I guess I was only like nine years old when this was all happening. Mm -hmm. And then at this, you superimpose on that like meta American politics. And so I became very, very politically aware uh, after 9-11. And I think it was, if I had to psychoanalyze myself, it would be a, it would be an effort to understand. I'm like, why, why is this happening? Like, why is, you know, this thing that's been very negatively impacted my life? I'm like, how, well, how did this all happen? And that led to a real interest. I remember my parents tell me when I was like 10 years old, I was like reading the newspapers and uh, I got really engaged in the Iraq war. And I would say Iraq is what truly uh, got me engaged, like Iraq and the war. I knew some people, some of my neighbors and others who have been deployed over to Iraq. And I just remember thinking like, this is just not right. And, you know, even, even when I was young. And so that kind of early opposition to the war is what activated me more than anything. And I just read a lot of books. I mean, I was a bored, you know, kind of nerd. <laughs> we're going to get into that. We're mm -hmm. going to get Actually, I want to yeah. just, sorry, but I want to ask you a question sure. about your childhood, yeah. which is, um, you know, you talk a lot about you were really good at public speaking. You're obviously fantastic, you know, on camera, look great. But I, how much do you think you growing up as a brown kid in a context which might have made you feel like an outsider made you somehow develop those skills which actually make you charming, you know, really good at like fitting in, really entertaining. And is there a through line there? Oh, I'm sure there is. I mean, I, but I don't know. I mean, a lot of it is uh, nature, too. My parents just told me that I was always just like a baby who would go up to people and to talk to them. Uh, and I was doing drama um, from a very, very young age. So I didn't actually start in politics or TV or anything. I was I loved being an actor. Um, so I did a lot of theater when I was very young. I mean, talking first, second grade wow. and continued it all the way up until my senior year of high school. Actually, I almost got a, a drama scholarship. So in another world, if I had not gotten that, I would have that been is like a, a drama theater scholarship yeah. for college, actually for wow. college. Okay. Uh, so in another world, if I had gotten that scholarship, it was a very competitive scholarship. But if I had gotten it, I, I don't know, my whole life would be different. I would have done a lot more. Theater. There is an alternative timeline where, you know, you're, you know, headlining blockbuster movies in Hollywood. Right now. <laughs> no, it would have been far less glamorous. Well, existence. or, you know, you're like the sidekick guy. You yes, know, yes, you far know, more uh, likely. What's yeah, the, yeah. Uh, what's the one, the Miss Marvel or Kamala? Yes. Which yeah. Are, yeah, that more that, likely that is you. ending up in that. Actually, there is another guy named Sagar. Uh, him and I have followed each other's careers. Um, for years of uh, coast to coast on Instagram because we have the exact same spelling. And he actually just got his big break as appearing in that movie. So the same wow. spelling. So right. I was like, are, are you a little jealous? No, no. Because okay. I said, finally, now you're finally famous like me. <laughs> wow. you know, I, I think, you know, I, 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 you know, one of the interesting things, like I think Andrew Schultz makes this comment about how, you know, we finally have Indians, you know, who might be seen for what they are mm -hmm. as opposed to you play like the white guy or the black guy, and uh, which is interesting. Okay, so. You here you are, you know, drama kid, you know, and then post 9-11, how does that lead to a, a career in journalism and how does it lead to the White House? Well, it's all politics. Uh, I just loved politics. I just loved it. I loved reading about it. I couldn't get enough. I watched all the documentaries. I watched all the every PBS American experience. I read it. I was reading biographies of presidents from an extremely young age. Uh, I was always especially hist uh, interested in the history of military conflict and war. I'd read a lot about, you know, I think everybody, ki every kid starts out in like World War II because it's simple. Mm -hmm. It's like pretty easy to understand. I, I can't even tell you how many books uh, I, you know, I'd read all the young adult books. And as I got older, I always had like a crazy, you know, quote unquote, reading level or whatever relative to what I was. And that's just all I wanted to do. I just could not get enough of both video content and of books. And I just incessantly read. And so in my mind, I was like, I don't want to do anything else. I was like, I just want to be in politics. So I moved when I was 18. I applied to GW. I was like, I just want to go to GW. I want to be in a city because what really uh, captured me about GW, this is like their main selling point and it's marketing. It's funny, though, because it totally worked on me, which is like you're literally in it like you're in downtown Foggy Bottom. The State Department is right mm -hmm. here. And to be fair to them, their selling point is not incorrect, which is that mm -hmm. by being there, you are literally have access to opportunities, which you would never have elsewhere. And that's what happened to me. So before I even started my freshman year of college, um, I was from you know this place, College Station, Texas, and we have this congressman who was there. And I just literally emailed his office and I was like, hey, I'm going to be in the city like can I come and work for you? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. 
you know, there's nobody from college station is ever in Wash. So mm. the day I arrived, I was 18. I had a Hill internship, which it sounds not that great, but actually most people don't really start doing it until second or third year. So mm -hmm. I had a very, very early exposure to like the nuts and bolts of Capitol Hill. of, And that was right in the middle of the tea party waves. It was a very interesting moment. And that was the first time that you would see like reality versus what you read, which is also a very, you know, important experience. But all throughout college, I would go through vacillations of like seeing it up close. I just realized I'm like, I don't actually want to work in this. Mm -hmm. This is difficult to describe to people, but being a staffer uh, for some of these people is an extremely unglamorous lifestyle. Uh, it's, give us an example. Like, what, what is, is it? What, like? is, what does the deal look like? Okay, I mean, at the lowest level, which is what it would require, is I would have to answer constituent phone calls where people are so mean and rude, and you just sit there and you just take it and you read a script. And it's it's just like complaints from somebody oh on God. the ground. Yeah, for yeah. people who are bored and they're just you know watching Fox and they're like, I saw that you're ruining the country. And you're like, thank you very much, sir. I've the always wondered who picks up the phone and does that. Oh, it's right. the interns. And the interns and the lowest level, the staff assistants, they are just brutalized. And, you know, there would be protests. People would come in. Somebody spit on me one time oh. um, at the desk. And you're just sitting there and you're like, I'm really sorry. The congressman here is, you know, and by the way, he's not getting any of this. <laughs> you know, he's like sitting yeah, off. And, totally and I don't blame crazy. him. It's not his yeah. job. It's yeah. my job. Like I signed up for it. But there is an entire, there are thousands of people. This is all they do every single day or writing form letters. I did a, I did a lot of form letters on, oh cause this God. is what happens. What happens is some interest group has an email list and then they email that email list and they'll say, contact your Congressman. And then we have to take it. And then once every Congressman is different, but then they set a level of, if you get a hundred emails on mm -hmm. one thing, then you have to reply. So then people like me, we would sit there and we create a form. You send it up the chain, it gets approved, and then you print them, and then you mail them. And then we would sit there, and we would fold, and we had an auto pen, and all that stuff. So people would, quote, feel like their concerns were heard. Right. Yeah, so it's like that. that is the level of uh, indignity that it requires. And I was like, ah, it's not the really. Other side, do you ever, ever fill out those petitions as, like, you know, yeah. as a citizen? No, he just tweets, right? Yeah, yeah. People respond to him. That's literally <laughs> true. Um, no, it's... I, that's the thing. I know what these people pay attention to. It's Twitter yeah. far more than any constituent email. Uh, also, I mean, in most cases, like I will know the person's boss boss. And I'm like, if I actually want to say something, like I'll go talk to that person. But the average citizen has no idea, you know, to them making a phone call, they actually think that they're talking to someone. And I don't want to discourage people because actually in the aggregate, if you get 500 to a thousand phone calls, a congressman will get a report at the end of the day and they'll say, wow, I got a thousand phone calls mm -hmm. on this issue. So it actually can make a difference, but only at scale, just so people understand. So let me ask you a fun question then. If you're a normal citizen, right, and you don't have 500,000 followers on Twitter, how do you get your and you don't know the boss's boss? Yeah, right. Like, yes. how do you get your congressman or woman to pay attention to something? Uh, go viral. Figure it out because <laughs> otherwise, it's going to be a tough. I mean, in in okay, here's there are two separate categories. If you are in what I would call like a group that has a lobby, your best mm -hmm. bet is so if you're a senior, go to the AARP because they have this town wired. If you are a veteran, you are going to be fine. Most likely you can talk to your VA person. You can email. There's usually like a VA person in every office. Right. Those people are highly responsive. If you are a senior, especially like in a non AARP context, like something's wrong with your social security, uh, offices are very responsive to those because seniors always vote, right? Anything happening with Medicare, social security, those types of things done. If you're a small business owner, and especially if you're a rich small business owner, you will have no problem getting your stuff resolved. But I do feel for the people who are like general, general, genuinely like average citizen. If you have a problem with the IRS or something, I mean, just forget about it. Like it, It's going to be almost impossible to get in touch with the right person. You can try and you can make a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails. But in my experience, uh, you it is going to be very difficult for you. It's like you, the younger self, you, who's basically just absorbing all of this. And yeah. 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 Uh, and how I am I supposed to know whether you're lying or not? People. Yeah. Don't yeah. I'm like, the and people lie all the time, right? You know, I'm like, they're like, I promise this. And I'm like, I know, sir, but you know, it's, this is the problem with government and constituent services, which is like, in one way I feel for people like at the DMV, you know, yeah. cause I get it. Like policies exist for a reason, which is that when you are dealing with humanity at scale, there is no carve out. Uh, because once you do, everybody has a reason. And it's very easy to game the system, too, which is why a lot of these policies 
are in right. place. So I see it from both sides. It's just what really the answer, Shriram, is it made me very cynical and not want to have to go through staff. And that is when I started getting interested in uh, media. Okay, so that's yeah. really the next part of the story, right? So yeah. here you are, a sp intern, handling phone calls, getting spit, you know, spat on um, from, <laughs> from there to, you know, being in the White House as a journalist. Yeah. How did it come about? Yeah, I mean, that really happened as a result of me just trying to assess like what I wanted. So I, I went through like a period of like, what do I actually care about? This is also difficult to articulate because it was a very different political time. This was a graduating from college in 2014. At that time, domestic politics was boring. It was dead. Like people didn't think about it in any similar way that they think about it now. They may think they were, but honestly, it was foreign policy. Foreign policy was the hottest topic at the time. Because I'll remind everyone, that was the rise of ISIS, Libya, right. Syrian civil war is hot. It's going on. Iran deal. This was, I mean, these were the major stories of the day. Um, so anyway, that's what I was really interested in. And that's kind of where the major debates, at least at the elite level in Washington, were playing out. And I always had actually a deep fascination with Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I started writing uh, some pieces uh, near graduation and near the end for a small magazine called the Diplomat Magazine, where I was just talking about the Afghan war and waste. And I actually that led to a internship slash job kind of thing at this think tank where, again, I was writing about Afghanistan. This is like a couple of months after. And then ultimately, I just met somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody else. And that's when I got this job at the Daily Caller. That's it was at that time headed by Tucker Carlson. This is before he went over to Fox News. And they were looking for somebody to write about foreign policy. My own personal orientation, I was very, very much I, it, it was difficult to describe, but like I was against the Obama consensus. I'll just say that as mm -hmm. in, I wasn't fully formed, but I just knew that what was happening wasn't right. And so I was a big critic. Anyway, that aligned very well with what they wanted, which is somebody who was a little bit adversarial to the administration and to the expected Hillary administration. We should also forget, you know, what was happening at that time. So that is kind of what I was hired to do. So it was like a foreign policy guy. And I did that and covered the Pentagon for about a year, all the way up until Trump won the election. And then what happened is, is that the person who was the White House correspondent for the Daily Caller actually left. She currently works over at CNN. She's the chief White House correspondent over there, Caitlin Collins. And then through like a shifting of basically they were looking for somebody who could cover a professional administration who they thought had the requisite chops, background and all of that, frankly, not to embarrass them and also to do a good job. And they thought that I could do it. And mm -hmm. I was scared. I didn't necessarily know. I mean, it's such a high profile position, especially this is so difficult to articulate, you know, because it's, it's such a different age. But there was such a spotlight on conservative media at the time. And there was an entire cottage industry even that was really wanting you to screw up so they could go after you because that in itself would become like a CNN story. Anyway, so I ended and you'd up, show up get, you know, you would show up on John Stewart or Colbert and yeah, well, you know, Stewart you... was off. But yeah, exactly. You would you would become an absolute joke on the Jimmy Fallon or uh, Jimmy Kimmel, something right. like that. And so my my main goal was fear. I was like, I don't want to end up that way. But <laughs> you know, it what actually helped. It them. sharpens exactly. Yeah. It sharpened the skill for me because I was like, no, the only way this works is if I become undeniable. I was like, I have to be so good at this that nobody can say a word about my work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is just what I really set myself to. I I said. I got the job and I was like, I am going to get called on in every single White House briefing room. And I made it my mission in life in order to make that happen, which, you know, the background machinations on that stuff is really fascinating. Like, Actually, I, wait, so talk to us, because I think for yeah. most people, when they think briefing room, they think yeah. West Wing and yes. CJ. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, how is it actually over there? It's far less glamorous. First of all, the briefing room is awful. It's made in the 1980s. It's a basement. It, it floods all the time. There's barely any, uh, there's no cell service down there. There's nowhere to like take a private phone call. So you'll see some of the most high profile political reporters like out in the snow huddling over like this on their phone. So all the, also it's full of camera equipment and trash. Uh, one of the first times I ever went viral is somebody put a wet bag of socks in a Ziploc bag and left it on the floor and I just tweeted it out. I'm like, whose socks are these? Like, who does this? Oh my God. Oh, there are people coming in and out of this room at all time, the foreign press, and everybody's always like looking for a power does out. Does it like, at least look like the West Wing set? Or uh, not it really? looks like that on camera uh, when you're there. <laughs> that's why <laughs> it's important. Yeah, that's all that matters. In terms of how it actually looks, it's dirty and 
There's oh my. crap all over the floor, trash, snacks, camera guys watching Netflix on their iPads. That's mostly what it's like. But anyway, so getting called on is a whole thing. Uh, at least it wasn't under the Trump administration. I can't speak to Jen Psaki, although I suspect that all the dynamics are similar, which is, first of all, nobody can call on you if they don't know your name. And so I was like, I need Sarah Sanders to know my name. And that mm -hmm. in and of itself was like a whole thing. And so, you know, I sent all these emails, to Sarah and her assistant, and I ended up camping outside of her office at like 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Just to catch her on her way into work. I literally just stand there and wait for her to get here. And be like, wow. Hi, Sarah, it's me, Sagar. My name is Sagar. It's pronounced this way. You should call on me. And every time she wouldn't call on me, I'd send her an email and then I'd send her assistant an email and I'd send like her assistant's assistant an email and I called everybody I knew. And finally, I got to the point where I get called. Well, on I love time. the hustle. It's just oh, so my. great. It, it took, that took six weeks. Getting called was six weeks of every single, it was, it was maniacal. I was like, I am going to get called on. And then we eventually got to an understanding, Sarah and I, that I am not going to ask some BS CNN Robert Mueller question. And I was going to ask something that I thought pertained to policy. And so I only stuck to policy. I'd only ask about North Korea, uh, yeah, immigration, the specifics of tax bills, sequestrate, all kinds of things like that. And I really enjoyed it because some of my questions would move markets and they had real impact on mm -hmm. Capitol Hill. And eventually, then the next level up of the game is to get called on by the president. That also is like a huge lobbying campaign to mm -hmm. say, because the way it works is something called a two and two, which is that every time the foreign leader visits the White House, mm -hmm. they have a press conference as a display of the American free press. So what happens is that the sitting president will take two questions from the American press. Mm -hmm. the, that person who gets called on, you get to ask President Trump a question or the sitting president a question, and you get to ask a foreign leader a question. And then the foreign president will ask two members of his press corps and they get the similar thing. So it's a two and two, like I said. Right. So there are hundreds of reporters, right? So becoming one of those two is very is, it's hard to get. And so, again, you, it's a whole lobbying campaign of you. Here's why you should pick me. Um, but then you also have to be ethical. So, they'll, so I mean, they'll what straight do you up, do like camp outside the oval mm -hmm. room. Like it's all by a text message and by right. email. So you're like, okay. hey, you should pick me. It's been three months. Nobody's called on me yet. You know, this mm -hmm. is an outrage. I represent this many people. Blah, blah, blah. So sometimes you have to guilt trip them. Okay. Sometimes you have to flatter them. There's all, all in the same conversation. Uh, sometimes did you get called upon? Did you oh, uh, four times, five times nice, actually? Yeah, nice, actually, I nice. set the record for for the new guy, and this is the same thing. It was the just hustle of emails, guilt trip, f uh, flattery. Uh, for all the first the same time, thing. who was the foreign leader? Sweden's president. I remember that one. And uh, actually, so also you're only supposed to ask one question. I asked two, um, but again, it's all about the way you comport yourself. So Trump, he's like Segar and Jetty. <laughs> he's like clicking around and I was like, thank you, Mr. President. Two questions, if I may, sir. And he's like, sure, sure. Okay. You know, it's like, here you go. Wow. Anyway, that impersonation is just like, that's, that's like well, so great. Unfortunately, I spent literally hours studying Trump. And so I sat there. I really came to like understand him and like what he wanted out of a press conference, which is he wants airtime. And he mm -hmm. wants to appear serious when he's with a foreign leader. And all you have to do is if you respect that general vibe, you can basically ask whatever you want. He could tell mm -hmm. whether you're trying to grandstand on CNN or not. And mm -hmm. look, I'm not like if you if that's what you want to do, that's fine. I was there to actually get information. So that became the hustle. But then the next hustle was the one on one Oval Office. Oh, yes. So this so, leads yeah. to your famous yes. uh, interview with uh, Trump. Right? Yes. Well, I've had four, but this is the first one. First one. So yeah. The first one that that took, I want to say nine months uh, in order to get. But and this tell again, me how, how did you make it happen? That is, oh, that is, if you think the question is a lobbying campaign full of flattery and full of, uh, uh, so anyway, it required everything I had, like the whole arsenal of yeah. throwing this at them, which is Sagar's first, <laughs> firstborn child is going to yeah. have a name, you know, from the yeah. Palmer press. Uh, yeah. I took people out to drinks, I took people out, uh, you know, people's assistants. I got knew everybody's name, I knew who was dating who, I knew who to ask. And so it's kind of like a bubble up strategy and, and, mm -hmm. and a war on many fronts. And so eventually <laughs> I got to the thing where after calling probably over 100 people and personally asking by email at least 50 or 60 times, they finally just wanted to shut me up. And they're like, OK, fine. Here were you they go. just exhausted at some yeah, point? They, they just were wore them down. Yeah. They, they were exhausted. They were like, OK, fine. You know, they were frustrated. 
And I was like, okay, great. Sounds good. <laughs> and so that led to the first one. Um, that was a lot of fun. Because... So paint the picture, right? You walk in, yep. where is it set? You know, how is Trump in a close setting? So it's very picture. rare. Uh, I actually got a scheduled interview three days ahead of time. That almost never happens with Trump, with Trump specifically. It was so I had three full days to prepare my questions. And so me and my bosses were like, okay, we're gonna get 15. They always tell you 15 minutes. It never actually is 15 minutes, but they tell you 15 minutes. So okay. Is it lesser or more? No, it's always more. But you okay. can't plan on that. So we're like, okay, yeah. we only have 15. And so my goal was I do not want to do the typical Washington game of walking in there and asking about a, a bunch of obscure stuff that only people in DC and CNN and other times will care about, which at the time was just the Mueller investigation. And I said, yeah, we'll ask one question, sure, but not only. Uh, so at that time, there was a lot of stuff going on, which is there was a Vatican scandal. So my goal was oh, to just yeah. make news. I wanted to make news across all sectors. Uh, Colin Kaepernick had just gotten his Nike campaign. Yep. Uh, the Apollo First Man movie had just like had a scene where they didn't plant the American flag. Uh, the Vatican scandal was going on. And so I was like, I want to make news in abroad. I want to make news uh, here in the U.S. Sports media. I was like, my goal is to rule the Chiron, which is the bottom thing mm -hmm. uh, on every news channel in the country. And yeah, so some great pop culture questions. Yeah. That was my goal, which and that's Trump. You know, Trump is a pop. He's a pop culture figure. Like he was the yeah. president. He, likes to, he liked to opine on everything. Exactly. That's the thing with Trump. And this is what political reporters always forgot. The way he became famous is by pop culture. Like that's frankly all he's actually qualified mm -hmm. to discuss. So that's why we, we focused on it. So we got ultimately it lasted 45 minutes and it was a back and forth and Trump is a very difficult guy. So yeah, I mean, the way it works is you have a time uh, and we were ready. It was like 11 AM, which is early for Trump. And uh, what would happen is, is that, and I'm talking, this is for real. We were literally standing there waiting 10 minutes before we go in there. The very first excerpt from Bob Woodward's book drops. And so my boss and I look at each other and we're like, oh my God, we're like, well, we have to ask about this, you know? And so he's in a terrible mood when we walk in there and you got the CNN blasting on the TV. He has this giant television, it's like 75 inches. And he's just sitting there like fuming over this. And anyway, so we get to sit there and we kind of get him, get him in a good mood. And we ask him about all of this and he's, he's hard, but we would, we, we had a good rhythm going and a good balance. Uh, but it's an amazing experience. I mean, the first time you walk in there, it's just crazy. I mean, for somebody like me, Cause I walk in and like, this is the dichotomy between me and Trump, right? Which is, I don't think he thinks about any of this stuff, but I look at the side and I'm like, wow, that's where Eisenhower used to mm -hmm. practice his putting. I'm like, this right. is where Nixon and Kissinger prayed on the floor. Like right here, like that's where Jack Kennedy took the iconic photo. Like that's a portrait of uh, Andrew Jackson. Like to me, I'm just looking around and I'm like thinking about all of these things you that I've keep, read about. You, you keep your phone on the Resolute desk. I know. That's that's the one that really freaks you out, which is that because you're using it to record. So you place it yeah. on the Resolute. I mean, that's where like, you know, Kennedy's kid was playing under. Like, yeah, it, right. Yeah. I mean, again, this is all in my head. I'm like, this is, you know, from the HMS Resolute. They only made yeah. two. Yeah. Uh, so it's like I'm sitting there <laughs> like putting my hand on the, or putting my uh, phone on the desk. It doesn't feel right, but I get it. It's fine. It's just everybody's. Where else are you going to put it? Yeah. yeah. And so we had, a, we had a good interview and actually it succeeded. So all, every, we led on ESPN, made news abroad, Italy. He made some comments about the Pope. I forget exactly what it was. I think we also asked him about Megan Rapino. And like the winter, again, that was my goal. I was like, I really want to make news everywhere. So that's what we did. And we made some Mueller news. So it was everywhere. And it was exactly what, uh, so apparently the White House liked it. But the next one was much crazier. I was literally sitting at my desk. I didn't even have a suit on because um, I, I wasn't at the White House. My office was like a couple of blocks away. And I got a call from an unknown number. And it, it, was, it was Sarah Sanders. She was like, hey, the president wants to talk to you. And I was like, Okay. What? I was like, nice. when? And she's like, can you be here in a half hour? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, like totally calm. And I was like, oh God. I'm like, I have a backup you suit. Hang luckily. up and you're just like yeah. running. Throw the suit on. I'm literally running on the phone while I'm running, talking to people. Be like, okay, here's what I got. What should we ask? This, this, and this. And it was actually the day, I want to say a couple of days after the midterm elections. And so this was a blockbuster interview because it was the first interview, long form interview he'd given. Um, since uh, th at that, that time, it was 2018, and there was the Democratic losses. So this made massive news. It's actually, frankly, one of the first times he also alleged voter fraud, mm -hmm. which I often think about. Uh, 
was during that interview. What do you think they called you and to do it then at that moment? I mean, I know why. They they thought they, their theory and always was, and frankly, this was strategic on my part, was I am not the guy who is going to sit there and be like, but what about Stormy Daniels and say it five times in a row? I'd mm-hmm. ask once because you have to, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm not just going to sit there. Everybody, most people who go in there who work for a national outlet, they have to follow up on whatever the quote current thing is, right? So at the time it was Stormy Daniels or Mueller and they would get into this back and forth of the details. And I always tried to take a 60,000 foot view, which is, look, this is the president of the United States. I'm like, he's got a, you know, and anything he says on a number of issues. Mm-hmm. So we, we could even ask him about, uh, I don't know if you remember the Las Vegas shooting. That was all a big thing at yeah. the time. So we asked him about that thing. Be like, hey, what do you know about this? Like, have you been briefed yeah. on this? So we would try to get news on, we would try to get news that I thought mattered much more to the rest of the country because I intuited at that time. I'm like, there is a huge disconnect. I mean, this is really- Why was it a blockbuster interview? Because Just because of the first comments on the election and Mm -hmm. reaction to the election Mm -hmm. and also first allegation of voter fraud, which was a big deal uh, at the time. And a lot of the a lot of the pop culture things that we would, we got to yeah. the FBI. I mean, I, people forget this, but you know that FBI story on the Las Vegas was huge story. I mean, it was mm-hmm. massive. There's still a lot of interest about what the hell happened with that guy. So, I like I said, I just I always tried every interview I did with him, zoom out as much as possible, mm-hmm. sixty thousand foot. I'm like, what are people at home thinking about, caring about? How can I serve them? That's really how I viewed. I mean, in a lot of ways, it connects to my work at Breaking Points, yeah. which is I just looked at this hole in political mm-hmm. media and I said, well, how can I feel it? I mean, this was a much more yeah. micro level at the time. Right. And I know that's why the White House called me. It's a mu- Listen, it's at that level. It's all mutual. They're using you. You're using them. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it's not there's no you're, illusions. You're not yeah. exactly a friendly, but they know, you know, the kinds of lanes that you might stay in. Yeah. I'm right. curious, how different was Trump? on camera and off camera? Or were there lessons on how to present yourself in public that you picked up from observing? Yeah, yeah. actually the suit thing is funny. Um, I Whenever I saw him, I was impeccably dressed. Impeccably. I mean, to the nines. Because I knew that's what he respects. Mm-hmm. He often would trash people. He hated John Bolton's mustache. He hated when people didn't have their ties on straight. He hated people who looked sloppy. So if I walk in there, my hair, if I knew, if I knew, you know, my hair is done, my shoes are shine, my tie is up to ground, my suit is well fitting, um, because I understood that that's what makes him comfortable. And he gets mm-hmm. kind of dazzled by it. He's also dazzled by people who are on television. So I used to do a lot of TV at that time, even if I didn't want to do it, I would do it on Fox, especially because I knew that he was. And of course, I mean, the very first time I ever met him, he's like, I saw you on Fox last night. He's a like, great job. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like, these are, these were all strategic. It was all part of a. It's all part of the game. Um, and I think that, you know, people at home can intuit that it's a game. I'm just describing how it's actually played out. Played out. Yeah. yeah. Here you are, you know, you know, getting, you know, being there at the heart of power, right? And talk to us about the partnership with Crystal. Like, how yeah. does that come about? And then obviously you folks go on the to do your, to do your own thing. But yeah. where does the partnership with Crystal start? Well, what happens is I was honestly just getting bored. Uh, I think covering the White House is extremely undignified. And the reason why is because you actually don't have a lot of power. And it kind of gets to what I was telling you, which is at the end of the day, you have to really suck up to these people in order to get the, the White House is access. There is they control everything. You control nothing. So you, by the definition, have to play by rules that they set out. Also, when you're a White House correspondent, your job mostly entails of chasing the president around the residence. As in, when he lands at Marine One, you stand there on the very off chance that he may come and talk to you on the you helicopter. Mean literally chasing him around. No, 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 I'm not kidding. Like literally chasing. Him. Yeah, yeah. Because there's this is the thing. There's only a limited amount of fence space, and there's a hundred of us. So there's a whole hierarchy. The cameras go in the front. Then the network guys get to go there because they claim that they have a reserve space, which is not true. There is no reserve. Then the photo guys have ladders so that they can climb up. Uh, if you're friends with the photo guy, he will let you stand under his ladder. Um, some people oh are. My God. Uh, oh, yeah. The girls always have an advantage because they're small. Um, so they'll be like small and short. And so they can put their heads in into crevices. I was taller, so I would kind of like go like this. It's a whole thing. It's a it's a this is a scram. People have gotten hit before. Uh, people have gotten slammed. People get elbowed. 
all the time. It's 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 a brutal game, honestly. I, I really still oh, feel oh my goodness. people uh, were still doing that. <laughs> so, okay, so you have no power and you're, you're bored. Yeah, because you're just, once again, you are literally just chasing Trump around. Uh, if he has a press conference, you have to go. If he, I mean, this is the worst. There's something called pool duty, which is that there's something called pool where everywhere the president goes, there's always a contingent of press with him, no matter where he goes, as a result of 9-11. Mm -hmm. Because if, let's say there's a 9-11 attack, like what happened on 9-11, there was a press pool there who were with President Bush on Air Force One so that they could broadcast messages anyway. So it's like the idea is that the president should never be separated from the press. Well, uh, that sounds cool until you end up sitting in the motorcade for like six hours while Trump is golfing. Mm -hmm. You're like sitting there on your phone like on a Sunday, just being like, why am I doing this with my life? No, but were you ever on Air Force One? On any uh, yeah, I went to Air Force One. Air Force One is cool. Um, it's uh, People don't know this, but the press has to pay. You actually pay for a first what? class ticket plus I had one dollar. No yeah, you have to pay for every time you go on Air Force One. You have to pay any to any foreign travel, all of that. The press is required to pay. Uh, there's something called a press charter, which is uh, sometimes it flies behind Air Force One, which takes all the press. You have to literally charter a flight. It costs tens of thousands of dollars in order to cover cover the president. When you cover the president domestically, same thing. If he's at the hospital, you're at the hospital. So I sat. You know, one time Melania had surgery or something. I was sitting in that damn hospital for like 10 hours and you just sit there. You just sit there all day. They have nothing, you know, and it's not like you're talking to them. You're there literally in the case of like a nuclear blast or some sort of 9-11 yeah. attack. <laughs> so you're, anyway, that's why I was, I was like, I need to get out of here. I was like, yeah. I, I just imagine thing. your incentives must be so busted over there. You're sitting there hoping for something to happen. Yeah, no, exactly. It's not good. It's a bad incentive. Uh, and I actually thought, I forget who told me this line. I heard it from somebody, which was look at, the career you're in and look at the guy who's 10 years ahead of you. And if you don't want to be doing that, then you need to get the hell out of there. And mm. I looked around and actually I was one of the youngest people in the press corps. And I was like, I don't want to be doing this mm. when I'm right, 35 right. or 40 or something like that. Right. I was like, I need to get out. So what happened is, is that at the time, Crystal, there was this at the Hill. So the Hill had its show uh, called rising. rising. And at the original conception of it was kind of like cable news on television or sorry, on the internet, mm -hmm. which, there was something there, but it, they didn't nail it. Mm -hmm. um, it. At the time, it was Crystal and this guy, Buck Sexton. Currently, he works over at, uh, he has his own, he took over for Rush Limbaugh's show. Anyway, so Buck and I knew each other, and Buck was going on vacation. And he was like, hey, man, I need somebody to fill in for me. I've seen you on Fox. So I was doing a lot of Fox at that time, like on the weekends. Any time I could, I was getting TV time, because I really loved doing TV. It was one of the things that I, I just really enjoyed doing it. So... I went over and I would fill in for Buck and Crystal and I would get along really, really well. Eventually it got to the point where Buck didn't really want to stay anymore. He had a podcast, us radio show. Um, and I think that's frankly his strong suit. I think he's really good at it. And he was like, you know, I'm thinking about leaving. Like, would you be interested in coming in and taking over the show? And that is, I mean, without doubt, like the biggest pivotal moment of my life because mm -hmm. I said yes. And everybody told me not to do it. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Because they were like, look, there's this internet on TV, you know, TV on the internet thing. It's not going to work. It's going to go bankrupt. There's mm -hmm. no audience. There's no, uh, it hasn't hit yet. If it hasn't hit now, it's never going to work. You have a steady career, Sagar. You're a good White House reporter. You know, a couple of networks were trying to hire me. I could have had a well, I could have had a fine career. And I could still be in the White House press court today. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'd be doing well. Uh, but I just didn't want to do it. You know, I, I, I love the internet. I love YouTube. I've always mm -hmm. been, I've been listening to Joe Rogan since I was like 22. Mm -hmm. um, all these, so I was, I was always a real, like a content online consumer, even before YouTube. I mean, I was, you know, like I told you my background, I was an online kid, I kind of always Reddit guy since for a long time. Anyway, so I was aware that there's a different world out there. And so Crystal and I both gelled really well and also had a similar vision of what the hell we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. is I came and I was like, this is no longer just going to be on the hill.com. I said, this cannot be on the hill.com. This has to be on YouTube. There's no question. I was like, it has to be on YouTube, 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 YouTube. Right. And I just came in and I said, our entire strategy is YouTube. But that's Always a huge YouTube. risk because you didn't have YouTube. any like inbuilt distribution, nothing. Nope. You're starting nothing. over. Literally. I mean, the, uh, the channel at the time had 6,000 subscribers. There's no audience, yeah. nothing. But I, I thought, what well, we have two things going for us. Number one, crazy production value, which is because of the set, the cameras, all of that. And number two, we have the hill.com aura. 
mm. which we could use for booking. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's go book a bunch of people with massive YouTube audiences. And that's exactly what we did. We went out and started booking people. And at first it didn't really work. The way it hit is actually with your previous guest, Andrew Yang. And he knows this. I told him this to his face. I'd be nowhere without Andrew Yang because Andrew knew Crystal from way back when. Mm -hmm. And he came to our show and we just did a basic interview with him. And actually, this is where my skills from the Trump time really took over. I just treated him like a normal candidate, like a professional mm -hmm. candidate. And we did a 20 minute interview, me, him and Crystal talking about China, technology, antitrust, mm -hmm. UBI. That interview got over 100,000 views in a single day. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. I, by the way, I just want to say, Andrew, uh, you know, we're recording this a day. We just published our Andrew Yang interview. Yeah. You know, Andrew is, is such a, you know, regardless of what you think of his politics, he's such a nice, charming, oh, intelligent yes. person. He came no over question. to our house, yes. you know, just opened up with just so easy to talk. He just to. literally walked right. in, put on his headphones and just came ready to play. Like it was just he, He's just such a genuine guy. And that really came through. And what happened is all of the comments were the same. It's just, thank you for just treating Andrew Yang seriously. Right. And that is when stuff really started to go off mm -hmm. in our heads. Because we said, that's what it is. They want, people want someone who will treat unconventional candidates seriously. Mm -hmm. And really, the ex if you extrapolate, that's a very powerful idea. People want somebody to use the professionalism they have learned in the news business me from my White House days, Crystal from when she was on MSNBC, but treat non-establishment ideas, people, candidates, et cetera, in a serious fashion. And that at its core, that was the success of Rising. Because from there, it just went stratospheric. I think within three months, we had 100,000 subscribers. Within three months, we had like 500,000. Within a year, we were at a million. And it was, uh, that is when it, everything just started to go viral because we exactly did this. The Sanders campaign was happening. So we treated the Sanders campaign, Trump campaign too. I used to talk to them at least once a week and we would give real interviews, not some BS about whatever the political scandal was going on. We'd have experts on, we had a lot of guests on, we had larger YouTube audiences and we would treat them almost like a normal interview. Like, so what do you think about the mm -hmm. ongoing thing? And all of it, the orientation just became, how do we fill this obviously massive hole which is developed from the cable news industry. That, that's all that exists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, you guys, you guys are friends with Balaji and actually I knew Balaji kind of at the time. And he, he said something to me, which always stuck with me. And I still quote it. He's like, always bet on charts because he was showing me some of the charts that he originally bet on. And I've, it's always thought, I'm like, at the end of the day, the success of rising and breaking points, the bet that we always made was trust in the mainstream media. The more it goes down, the bigger your market. And so mm. we would think about that. I mean, trust in the mainstream media is like 11%. I'm like, okay, yeah. that means 89% of the people are up for grabs. So when you think about it, that is just such a core like value proposition to start off. And I mean, within a couple of months, I just knew it was a hit. I mean, this is one of those, sometimes when you hit, you just hit so big. And, and then, you know, the relentlessness that I described about the hustle, we just did the same thing, which did not let up. We posted every day hundreds of hours of content over and over the data, the channel was never dark. And that's, I mean, at the core of the content game, that's what it is, is your ability to consistently deliver value. And consistency is frankly, even more important than talent, talented people come and go. But if you cannot consistently work and you can cannot consistently put yourself out there and also adapt to varying conditions, because we went from a democratic primary coronavirus pandemic, 2020 election, you know, yeah. January 6, Biden. I mean, if you can survive these All multiple different news cycles, then you have something. And that, what, that's what actually do, what when somebody, an average person comes and listens to your show, what do they come for? Uh, they, well, it's changed a lot, right? Which is that today we are kind of the news for a lot of people. For a right. lot of wow. people, we are the news. And I, and I, that's actually frankly kind of scary because that is the, uh, that's a very big responsibility, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I get messages and I meet people sometimes uh, who are like, oh, I got vaccinated because of you or like, I, you know, I'm just like, oh my God. Wow. That's a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, like, a lot of weight. Or like you really changed, fast. changed my relationship with my dad because I understood like, and I'm like, whoa, you know, this, yeah. that's, yeah. that's, those are the ones that really stick with me the most. But so I would say today, today, like where we are for a certain select portion of our listener base, 
we are the news for a certain select portion of our listener base. We are, uh, we provide a view there. There, I would call them in the top one or 2% of news consumers and right. they want to see what everybody's saying. So they want different takes on what's happening and that's fine. So yeah. for a lot of people, I'd say general interest is probably our highest. Then there's like a commentariat aspect to it. And then, the more casual user, they're coming in for only certain segments. So they'll come in for a UFO segment, a Jeffrey Epstein segment, for a segment on some people are really interested in policy. I do a lot of stuff on semiconductors, mm -hmm. something on China. I mean, they're they're this is actually very typical of the way most people consume the news. Mm -hmm. Most people are topic dependent. Most people do not want to engage with the news every single day, which is totally fine and actually mm -hmm. even works to my advantage in terms of the YouTube model, which right. is you know, in terms of your recommendation algorithm, you're just going to get whatever is you're already interested in. Wow. Um, you know, I think what you said something earlier, which I think is a deep truth to it with Andrew Yang, which I believe people know when they're being lectured to or yes. when they're being have, they have or a message being to. shoved 100%, 100%. down to them. And with Yang, um, and I think what you and Crystal do, it's not that, you know, you're right and Crystal's left or anything. It was like, oh, this is not somebody telling us what we should think of Andrew. Because at the mm -hmm. time, a lot of people, you know, in quote unquote, the mainstream media were treating Andrew as a joke candidate. He has all these stories about like producers were told to never, ever book Give him airtime. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And I think there's a, you know, a very refreshing, you know, uh, and I think there's a true line through between what you folks do, what Rogan do, uh, does, or Lex Friedman does, which is you were like, okay, we're just going to treat them, you know, like we treat everybody else. And you, the viewer, make up your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I treat Andrew Yang the same way I treated Donald Trump, right? right? I would ask him exactly the same type of questions. I did the same uh, Bernie Sanders, Josh Hawley, any of them. I, I Joe Rogan, every time I talk to them, it's it. That's ultimately mm -hmm. what it's about. It's also about on issue, and this is this is tough, right? Because a lot of politics has devolved into here. I'm going to tell you what I think, and I always try to come at it both with Crystal and me, but also with the audience. Is no matter where you're coming from, I get it. I respect you. If you're angry, it's okay. I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you not to be angry. If you're happy about something, I'll just be like, I get it. I totally understand. I have a little bit of a different view. I'll tell you why. But I actually think that probably, I mean, it's interesting. You know, I was just in Portland, Oregon. And, you know, a lot of people, I met a lot of people there who are fans of the show. And I heard that all the time. They're like, you know, I just really thank you for uh, respecting and, and kind of understanding a little bit about where we're coming from. Usually it's people in the service industry and, you know, mm -hmm. they, they feel especially just like crapped on, you know, over the last six, seven months. And, and that's really all people are asking for. If you also think about it from a political, uh, view, I mean, what are, what grievance politics is politics today. Mm -hmm. It's not affirmative, which there's a dark side to that from a media perspective, which you could balkanize the public and just mm -hmm. say this, is their fault, this, is their fault. Or you can start from a, a about like, hey, I get it. I get why you're mad. And yeah, you can blame the other side if you want to, and that's fine. There's some validity to that, maybe. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit more. And I think that that just acknowledging it really, because if you when you don't, that's when people feel like they're going crazy. My okay. fa my favorite comments on what you folks yeah. do, if you go through, is somebody would say, hey, I don't agree with Sagar Crystal, but I kind of respect it, right? Like, yeah, you know, I kind of respect yeah, it. I see the point. It's well articulated. Okay, but. So here you folks are, you're killing it on the hill, right? And then you do something, you know, which must have been really scary, which is to go off and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I just, I'm online enough to be aware of trends. So I start to see this thing called Substack. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Then I start to see people there make a killing on Substack. And I was like, well, that's very interesting. This seems a little bit analogous. Actually, I know some of these people. Some of these people are my friends, Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, others. And I start looking at The Hill. I realized that the show is not what I want it to be. At the end of the day, we did not, we worked for The Hill. We we're employees mm -hmm. of The Hill. So from a reputational perspective, that means that my own reputation is actually, frankly, suffering for mm -hmm. working for this larger DC-based institution which has all of these institutional ties of which I am suffering as a result of. I've told these stories publicly, but you know, sometimes I'd criticize politicians or companies and then those companies or politicians would reach out, not to me, but to my boss's bosses and try to shut me up or get me to issue an apology. And I, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I was, I literally at one point I was like, yeah, you can fire me. I was like, I won't say anything. 
I, I'm, I will not apologize. Mm-hmm. That one was about TikTok. Uh, TikTok was coming after me and trying to shut me up. But we should definitely, we should, we have a whole thing we should talk about, about in, social in media and TikTok think, in China. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And even with the Andrew episode, I think we also like cover TikTok there a little yeah, bit on yeah, yeah. social media. Yeah, in yeah but I China. think you know, there is a trend, I think, at the time of, uh, you know, subscribe, but I also think about, say, Alex Cooper, yep. you know, breaking off from um, Barstool to, you know, do the Spotify deal, which is the power resides in the audience's connection to you and crystal right Correct. dad and mom um and i think and this kind of a shifting of power dynamics between you versus maybe the brand which got you there in the first place correct and, and i mean that is ultimately what we intuited i'm like what is the value it's us it's mm-hmm. us talking it doesn't have anything to do with the hill anymore at the beginning it definitely did and so it's just one of those hey no hard feelings but we're just not going to stay here and we understood that with the right way that you would create the business. I mean, that's, I read, I read a lot. I mean, I listened to a lot of media podcasts and studied um, Andrew, Andrew Wilkers. I think it's Andrew Wilkinson. Is that his mm-hmm. name? He found, I think he founded Supercast. I read his, um, his blog post about how Joe Rogan got ripped off by going to Spotify. Now, I, I don't think Rogan got ripped off, but it, had something. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Then I started reeling about the law of conversion, about X amount of your audience, as long as it converts, then mm-hmm. you start doing the math and you're like, hey, I actually could make this work, even though the budget's like a million dollars a year in terms of production. You're like, well, mm-hmm. you know, if you do it right, you actually can nail it and mm-hmm. you could do it the way that you want it to. And then I started really thinking about that with Crystal and I was showing her both the economics. I'm like, here's how it could work. Here's the business. Uh, got connected with Supercast. I talked to them for hours and hours. And ultimately, like we came to an understanding and they were they helped us immediately in terms of the actual launch itself. So we worked together on the copy, on uh, making sure everything was set, ready mm-hmm. to go. All of the back end systems were working. And then uh, then it just came down to a matter of production. And look, I mean, production is hard, but it's not that hard. Like if you <laughs> find the right guys and you find a studio and some cameras, we did a couple of dry runs. It's expensive, but as long as you can cover your costs, and that was my only goal. I said, let's just cover the cost for mm-hmm. a year. Let's cover mm-hmm. costs. Mm-hmm. And it worked out. So, I mean, it, it I mean, did phenomenally well. I never expected it to go this way. I did never, you do never anything differently now that you've like been through this for a year? Uh, in terms of the launch? No, I don't think so. Honestly, no. I think it all went uh, exactly how it needed to. We partnered with Supercast, mm-hmm. so we knew that we, we, so first of all, with Supercast, I was like, well, the tech is there. We can easily process transactions. So I was like, that's good. On YouTube, I had a, I knew that we would be back up to X amount. And I, my, my goal was, yeah, I think it was like 300,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I think ultimately we ended up at like 800,000. But I was like, okay, if we hit 300,000, we had X amount of views. I'm like, based upon that and average revenue, because I knew we were making it the hill. And I was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure we could use that and cover costs. So Honestly, no, I don't think so. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of intentionality that went into the pricing, that went into the tiers, that went into also the back end systems, right. whether to use Patreon or Supercast or right. Mailchimp or any of these things. And I did a lot of dry runs with Crystal too, setting it up, and ultimately has survived the test of scale. So I'm yeah. I'm very happy about that. How how important was it for you to diversify income streams, like just revenue? Oh, very important. Because, I mean, one of their main concerns is when you're independent, there's no backup and right. YouTube could disappear tomorrow. And then that was really the initial pitch. I was like, listen, we cover very controversial topics here. And but this actually happens to us all the time. Um, right. We'll just get segments which are demonetized. And while I will fight with YouTube about it, at the end of the day, I do get it, which is that if I'm talking about rape or... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein mm-hmm. or a uh, horrific video out of Ukraine. This particular interview is not going to disappear yes. from the algorithm yeah, forever sorry. because, I yeah, I know. You I screwed us over. Sorry, I apologize. Just, just don't mention the name of the okay. pandemic yeah, yeah, and we'll yeah, be just, okay. Just, right. I won't say anything. On a serious note, I have to say, Sagar yeah. uh, has been so helpful in us doing this. He's probably the first person yeah. I hit up in Super the middle supportive. of the night uh, yeah. for advice. Um, and, you know, for everything, you know, on how to think about YouTube, how to think of being a content creator from the philosophical to the bare bone. So, you know, he's a truly a men's show, you know, a huge shout out. It's but very yeah, nice so, of you. yeah, yeah, I mean, I get into fights with them because I'm like, listen, I believe in YouTube. I think it's the most powerful force on the planet. And I really do. I really believe that. But if you believe that news on YouTube is important, sometimes the news is bad. 
Mm. Like, and actually very often the news is bad. Sometimes mm -hmm. the most significant news is really bad. Mm -hmm. And you can't penalize people for reporting the news in the way that's done. My, my, the one that drives me insane is if you, if you play a clip of Trump saying the election was stolen, mm -hmm. that is grounds for your video removal. Even if ahead of the clip, you're like, just to be clear, this is not true. All of this doesn't matter. They are within their rights to take that. I mean, they're always within their rights to take anything down, but per their content policy, they have enforced that. Because they flag it as misinformation? Because they flag it as misinformation. And they oh. won't restore it even after a human review. And as I've said, I'm like, listen, he's the former president. Sometimes we have to cover him. I mean, mm -hmm. right now we're doing you know all this stuff with the FBI and midterm elections. I mean, we have to cover the new... What if he runs for president? Like, how am I supposed to cover the Trump campaign mm -hmm. if I'm not allowed to play a speech from the Trump campaign? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, in, that's an absurd mm -hmm. thing. And one of the points that i make is you're giving linear tv a huge leg up because they have no they have no uh, content moderation except right. for what they impose on themselves mm -hmm. and then obviously the fcc but even you know on cable that doesn't even apply so really you're giving them better content policies mm -hmm. over us even though you claim that you want to beat them so like that is where some of the wrangling uh that i'll have with them but at the end of the day i get it they can do whatever they want Right. That's why we have other streams of revenue, subscriber being the predominant one. And also, uh, this was an interesting one, which your audience may be interested in. We did not want to read podcast ads. We're just very, at the end of the day, we're yeah. news personalities. And I can't be like, brought to you by Manscaped. You know what I mean? It's just, it's not going to work. <laughs> um, we're like, Casper, have you heard about Casper mattresses? Or like, I just, it, it wasn't going to happen. So yeah. it was hard. I, I was actually resigned. I was like, I guess we just won't make any money mm -hmm. on this. But uh, actually struck a deal with Spotify and Megaphone where they do dynamic ad insertion on all of our pods. And it works fantastic. A, the tech is great. And B, they have just been so good to work with. So mm -hmm. that's set up an alternative revenue stream as well. So, you know, if one, if one leg goes out, the business will be fine. Yeah. Got it. So I have, I have an interesting question for you. So you do do uh, you do two long running streams of content with the co-host, right? One of the yes. Crystal, one with Marshall, the Realignment Podcast, yes. right? What is the dynamic of doing content with a co-host? Speaking as somebody who's trying to figure <laughs> it out, right? You know, like what makes it work? Well, you guys have uh, an advantage, which is number one is trust, which is the, the it's <laughs> the core is. Is this person going to screw me over? Is well, this person? Also, the other advantage is like, wait, I know if I mess up, I'm going to get yelled at. Well, that's a very I... powerful check. Uh, <laughs> but wait, what, is, what does trust mean in this case as a co host? Uh, so I, I'll just tell you. So I've never worked in this environment, but I do know many people who have, which is the dynamic of 90% of cable news hosts is they hate each other secretly or hate each other openly uh, on the air, which frankly can make for good. TV and yeah. they're all angling for more airtime than the other person. Gotcha. It's a okay. very discreet phenomenon. She wants to win. He wants to win. He wants to screw her over all of that. And just from the beginning with Crystal, where I was like, Hey, like I got your back. You know, one time Rush Limbaugh went after, he said some horrific stuff about her. And I was just like, Hey, this is, I was, can I curse here? I don't want to overset my you mouth, can but, go, yeah, go for it. I was like, this is bullshit. I was like, this is bullshit. You know? And I, there was no, frankly, I only took heat for that, but, I mean, she was my co like, I'm just not going to stand by yeah. for something. And she was like, I, that would never have happened in MSNBC. And I was like, oh, I, this isn't a question, mm. you know, in my mind and vice versa too, actually. So it's one of those things where, when, when you have a really strong trusting relationship and same with Marshall and Marshall was my best friend for like 11 years, it's just the same mm -hmm. thing. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I don't care if, you, you know, like, I don't care what you're doing yeah. in a, I don't care if you're doing better than me or vice versa. Like it, it's weird. We're all good. We're just, we're trying to have a good time. Uh, and with Crystal and I, like we're, we're, we want to have a good show. We want that show to be best for the audience. And it's not necessarily about trying to score points on one another. Cause a lot of people do that. A lot of people, mm -hmm. what they want out of a YouTube interaction is to have clips of that go viral. And let's be honest, those go really viral. So and so mm -hmm. own so and so. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the just, thing. Just wait, Sagar. We have some stuff where you are going to get be my owned. guest. <laughs> own me. I mean, I'm sure you get hundreds of thousands of views doing that. I have an entire hating uh, place, and that's fine. I, I accept that. I, I this is the thing. I don't bemoan the existence of that. I am guilty. I've watched many of those videos myself, but uh, <laughs> I understand. I understand though that that existence, and then also me consciously with Crystal and Marshall defying that norm mm -hmm. 
-hmm. is also what opens up our huge segment of the audience. And I'm always going to bet on that, which is that just because there is the existence of lowbrow and all this stuff does not mean you have to give in. And in fact, I think in saturated markets like that, the best move you can make is to bet against it and to do the counterintuitive. I think I think also it's just really powerful because the audience built a connection to both of you. Like yes. I mean, whether when you switch sides from left to right yeah. or you know your mom and dad, and I think that's just so powerful over time, and the audience builds a connection to you. Which I think so. Rogan talks about how he doesn't like having two hosts on because he doesn't want to know what the other person's thinking. But I think if you can make it work, it is a really powerful thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, to be fair, Crystal and I have both been on together on Rogan twice, and we never Mm -hmm. had an issue in terms of cutting ourselves off. That's the other thing. If she knows that I have a tendency to talk a little bit, and she has no problem cutting Uh, me off. I I may or may not. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, What's funny, though, is that people will comment and be like, Crystal needs, and I'm like, no, I, I, it's not even that I let her do it. I get the same thing. It's like, I want her to do it. Because I know I have a tendency to ramble. And same, sometimes I'll hold up my finger kind of like this. And she knows that that means that I want to make a point. And she'll maybe stop making a point uh, in the middle so that I can speak. These are things that, though, that you learn really only years Mm -hmm. of trust with somebody Mm -hmm. else. So that's why I think the bedrock is trust. uh, We we had Balaji on our show. um, And Balaji, who's a dear friend, he loves us for this. He's the first to admit that he likes to go off on tangents. Yes, Yes, he does. So the entire video is of us trying to nudge him back into spaces and all the comments are like you folks are cutting her apology and every I every wonder- comment people said the people same thing about me us. and i'm like listen i know you think that that's what you want but you don't and i know this as a host as somebody who is like i love biology too i've interviewed him several times and this you're right which is look i love the guy but he needs to be channeled right like we got to channel him in the right <laughs> direction his, and his, that his, may like, feel the way like, his mind works. Yes. You pick a topic, yeah. go super deep, like right. three levels deep. Yeah. And then it'll be like, Oh, and now, and then he'll like pop the stack, yeah. so to speak, and then go right. to the next topic, go super deep. So an hour in, you've basically covered yeah. one topic exactly. and you're like, Oh, this is not like, you know, the right. viewers don't want this. Also, he lives 12 hours away. So it's not that easy to schedule the guy. <laughs> right. So it's like, I've only got you for three hours. <laughs> You know, like uh, every conversation going to end with Walter Durante and the New York Times, and you're like, yeah. no, no, hold on, like, I, yeah, okay. like, well, anyway, I was like, okay, how was your childhood? Um, yeah. but uh, okay, so you mentioned Rogan, so let's go there. Uh, you know, how was what makes Rogan work? And I'm asking you because you have been interviewed, and I think mm-hmm. you also interviewed Rogan yeah. from his old, uh, I Set think his up. old place in LA, if I remember. Well, I, really- I interviewed him in Austin, but I have been in the LA studio. My right. first appearance was in the LA studio. Second one was in Austin. Interviewed him in Austin. I, it's interesting. Uh, Rogan is one of those people I both count as like a friend and as somebody who has been enormously impactful on my own career. But I also have really studied Rogan. It's also weird when you get to meet people who you have studied. Like I, he's probably I've probably spent more hours listening to him than probably any single other content creator. Right. So you really do feel like you know somebody. Ultimately, with Rogan, what I came to understand is that almost anybody who is projecting something onto him is missing the bigger picture. Mm. Rogan is himself, which just so happens to align with several different markets. Number one, there is fitness Rogan. There are many people who are only into Joe Rogan for fitness-related conversations. Two, there's diet Rogan. And people forget this because he doesn't focus much on it now. Years of the Joe Rogan experience was dedicated to wars. And I mean wars over vegan, carnivore, omnivore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, level of he- like level of detail, which is mind numbing to most folks, except weirdos like me who are actually into it. Three is MMA Rogan, right? Which is Rogan has an entire fan base who only know him as UFC Joe and mm-hmm. have watched him for 20 years on this beloved franchise with dana white four is comedy rogan who he obviously rogan is a comedian he's friends with all these other famous comedians and his back and forth conversations with them and then six is like hunting rogan which don't forget that is a massive audience so and then i guess seven is actually drugs rogan so it's like you know dmt marijuana all that so if you put all of that together that is joe rogan and that is why it's kind of like what i was talking about with the news most people don't listen to every episode. 
It's incredibly rare. Most people mm -hmm. just listen to, and his genius is that he just puts up an incredibly diverse array of guests, all of which kind of fall under this umbrella of mm -hmm. one of the seven or so. I'm sure I'm missing some, Rogan. And then every once in a while, somebody will listen to this. Mm -hmm. And if you get enough people at scale, that's a millions and millions and millions of people. Mm -hmm. right? And I think so, you have to project out your core interest. So if somebody's listening to Arthi and me, you're going to get... I'm a huge fan of pro wrestling. You want to get some WWE exactly. in there. You know, you're going to definitely getting tech people, which is yes. what people expect. But you also get folks from India, and it. But it's, it's and I think you, unless you're genuinely interested, it's not going to work. Okay, I'm going to start. Correct. Let me walk through some other people that you and I, you know, talk about uh, really admire, and I'm curious to see what you think of what makes them work. Uh, Andrew Schultz yes. having a moment. You know, probably the funniest person online right now. What do you think of his journey and where he is right now? I love Schultz. Been friends with him for a couple, or I think two years. I actually reached out to him after I heard him on Rogan. I, he said something which was really impactful about the changing way of the comedian business, about the move away onto the internet. I started studying him too. And I was like, man, this guy's a genius. And I was just like, hey, man, would you would you mind coming on for an interview? And uh, he did. And we, uh, we talk all the time. Um, and he, it's he, what he gets, first of all, he also was just a believer in YouTube. He believed in an alternative funding model for comedians, and he bet on it big, very, very early, which mm. takes a tremendous, tremendous amount of courage. Because what he intuited is people on YouTube are not normal comedy fans. They mm. want to see short bits because, and this is the same thing I did with the news, if I can get you to trust me in two minutes and I can get you to do that five times, then you'll trust me for an hour. Nobody mm. trusts for you for an hour up front. This was also, don't forget, JRE Clips is how Joe Rogan became famous. It wasn't through the hours long mm -hmm. Joe Rogan mm -hmm. interviews. He took that and applied it purely to comedy. So his comedy bits would go viral. He focused a hell of a lot of attention. And then he would use that, number one, in order to keep watching him for free on YouTube and then sell tickets. That was all of his strategy. His strategy mm -hmm. is he never wanted to charge anybody online for anything. All he wanted was for you to come and see him so he could make his money on the road. And that's ultimately what he did. So Schultz was a pioneer and an entrepreneur in the space long before most people mm -hmm. were doing it. And that's part of why Flagrant 2, his podcast, has been so successful. Why? I mean, I've, I've seen him live a number of times and gone to, uh, gone to some of his shows. And just, the audience that he has, I love it because that is YouTube to me. It's mm -hmm. everybody. Black, white, old, young, Hispanic, Indian. I mean, Everybody. The only show which it reminds me of is honestly Russell Peters, who also got famous on YouTube. People yep. forget this. Russell was the OG YouTube comic, and it's only because somebody ripped his special and put it on in 2006. Right. And I watched that. I yeah. I actually got to meet Russell. Thanks to Andrew. Uh, actually, whenever he came to the, I told him that I said, "Man, you know, I watched your special when I was like 14 or whatever, like on YouTube." Yeah. <laughs> He's like, "I hear that all the time." You know, Charles, uh, by the way, we, when we were preparing for this conversation with you last night, you know, yeah. we were playing a bunch yeah. of, you know, your videos. And uh, there is an amazing video, which anybody listening should watch, which is you going on, um, you know, Charles's podcast, talking yeah. about the Hunter Biden, um, you know, laptop and censorship. I don't know whether you even right. remember this, probably but yeah. this is like at 11 p.m. last night. There's we, Charles about... and there's Akash. And then there's yeah. like you, you're just like video calling in. Uh, oh sure yeah this is like two years ago yeah, yeah it's fantastic and we were just kind of sleepy and tired we, you know we want to make sure we you know we had all the research on you and and we just burst out like laughing because i don't there's a bit about indians being on top of things yeah, yeah, and yeah. uh uh this, and what i what I, one of the things i like really like about andrew is that uh you know he understands enough about all these other communities yes he does and then he'll kind of make a joke which kind of like a wink about the stereotype like for example he went really viral about the Sikh joke that he made like yes, a year ago that's right. and, uh, but we were just rolling on the floor and, and we were at, at some point we were like did you hear that no you missed that and we'd like go back yeah. and like listen to it again it was yeah. just so good you know what that comes from? That's from him being from New York City. I think that's from him growing up and born and raised in New York City, being surrounded by people. It's funny, too. I saw him in Miami, and he was on fire because mm. it was uh, in Miami. He was making fun of everybody. He was going after the Cubans, going after the Haitians. He's like, you ever see Haitians just walking around, man? He's like, Haitians love to be walking. And I didn't get it, but these <laughs> Haitians were dying. They were like, yeah, that's what these old Haitians do. <laughs> and, yeah, oh, man, it was great. It was it was fantastic to watch. It really was. Uh, okay, he was one more person who I think we both love and admire, Lex, Lex Friedman. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was interesting. 
props to Lex. He reached out to me totally on, uh, I'd never even met him before. I was just a fan. I'd listen to him. I loved my conversation with Lex. It's one of my, actually one of the best interviews. One of my favorite interviews I've ever done. That's how I found you. Yeah. I reached yeah. out to you because I, uh, that I, opened me up to a whole new audience. It's interesting. I never thought about that, but that was actually a big moment for me. A lot of people who never would have known who I was otherwise watched that interview. What makes him work as an interviewer creator? Yeah. Lex, it's uh, his authenticity. I mean, mm. he's he's super intense, you know, very, uh, I think he just, he takes life and everything he does so seriously mm. that comes through in the questions that come, I don't know if people know this, but like he prepares like a serious questions, you know, and most of the time I actually hate people who prepare questions because I don't like ultra structured conversations. But what I realize is that it's not a blueprint for what, everything that he was going to ask. It helps him organize like thoughts and give his him thoughts. a background. And and so what I came to understand is it was his process to get the best interview. And so now I'm like, that's fine with me. I, I was like, you know, you asked me too. I was like, do you have anything you want to talk about? I'm like, I listen, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that if you're in this business and you can't just show up and talk about anything, I'm like, you shouldn't be in this business. Um, but uh, <laughs> Because I think there are two yeah. schools of thought on preparing. Like, yeah. for example, uh, Howard Stern, right? Like, yeah. he, he prides himself on, uh, when he had Jon Stewart on, he found the first ever joke Jon Stewart had ever said on stage and John is blown away. Mm -hmm. um, or Narwhal, like, there are all these kind of characters and personalities who are like, we're going to go super deep. And then you have a lot of people who are like, I'm going to go with the flow and figure it out and what do you think of those two camps and where do you fall in i'm well okay so if i'm interviewing a politician it's different then you have to prepare because your job is to extract information out of somebody if i'm interviewing somebody of like a pop culture or somebody like that then i'm i'm really gonna go either with contemporary events mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. usually a hook as to why i even wanted to speak with them in the first place i mean for example i, I never do this i don't interview actors but uh, do you know John Bernthal? He's he was the Punisher. Um, mm, yes. And, yeah. So anyway, he's a huge fan of the show. I had no idea. He reached out to me, and he, I was like, "Oh, sure, man. Like, come on, we'll talk." And it was very simple. I was just like, "What is a guy like you watching this show for? You know, like, mm -hmm. why is this Hollywood elite? Like, what what what, what possibly could resonate with you?" And so, like, that was just the only thing that. And then from there, we would stem. So I I am very much of the opinion of if it is somebody in power. And your job is to extract information from that person. Or if you're interviewing somebody in power and you want it to be not a critical interview per se, but holding that person to account, then yes, you need to prepare significantly. Every single one of my Trump interviews, I prepared for hours and hours and hours. Anytime I had the opportunity to ask a question of Trump or a visiting leader like a Sweden's prime minister or Shinzo Abe or mm -hmm. uh, higher Bolsonaro, I spent a lot of time. Uh, actually studying their countries and being like, what could I ask them that would make news in their country and my country as a sign mm -hmm. of mutual respect? Yeah. But again, that is out of respect for what I'm doing at that time. Yeah. If that okay, I'm going to make a dramatic, uh, this is a very structured bit, but yes. I don't so this, oh, uh, it's good to see it over here, uh, yeah. you know, um, uh, this is actually, Sagar was super, super kind, probably gave me one of the best gifts I've gotten in uh, recent <laughs> years, which is this is the Lyndon Johnson sign path to power. Yes. Uh, so, uh, it's but, just such an incredible gift. It's super thoughtful. You. I no, remember no, no, here, no. I'm opening the box and then just like looking at the box for like a good couple minutes. I'm like, what's going on? And yeah, he's I like, was in love. I and was... he's like, and he pulled out the handwritten card and he was like, he's just like, like really it. touched. You could, yeah. like, Sharam is not speechless very often. <laughs> so, when you've just like, you know that there is a minute of just silence. You know that you've like really cracked it. Yeah, so oh, that's the way to my heart. Like, trust me. Like, yeah. that's a, but that's a great idea. Sending books. That's so good. Uh, so, you know, actually, I got that from Bill Gates. Uh, he gave an interview like 15 years ago. Right, I remember and, that. One. Yeah, and he, people were like, "What do people even give you when you're so rich?" And he's like, "People just give me books." And I was yeah. like, "You know, that's what you should give most people." Yeah. I was like, "That's a great gift." So, yeah, uh, fantastic gift. Thank you. It's just, it's. A, I think you know what? I'm just going to keep it here in our you know little studio space so everyone always see it. But why? I'm curious. You are obsessed with Carl, Carl. right? Obsessed. Um, and it's funny because actually when I was preparing for this, I like going through you know there are all these recent profiles of him and the final chapter. But for somebody maybe an obscure population who's not read his LBJ works or broker. Why does Caro matter? Robert Caro's series of LBJ is both, this is my pitch on all presidential biographies. It is a great way to learn about a person, to learn about a time and to learn about history all rolled into one. And Caro, he actually has said this in his interviews. 
The books are not called The Life of Jin Lyndon Johnson. They're called The Life and Times of Lyndon Johnson. And the reason I love those books is because they are mini vignettes into mm. history with such deep articulation of the place, of the time, of what it was like to live then, of what the actual political conditions of the time, all of the confounding variables that help you understand how things like the Civil Rights Act, how things like rural electrification program. How did FDR work as an actual politician? My own state, Texas politics. You know, in Texas, we took this class called Texas History. That class is trash compared to what I actually learned from Robert Harris. Because I learned about the soil, about these the German- The first few chapters of the first book, Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's a history of weather. You're like mm -hmm. learning about longitude and latitude and what grows and what. I never thought about it once, you know? In Texas, they're just like, yeah, they showed up, and then we fought a war against Mexico. You know, we did, we did, we never even thought about like the foundations of Texas, of what it meant, of the Comanche, of what the life was like for the people who first got there, and how a lot of that actually translates then into both the politics and the ethos of the state today, and really all gets folded up into this character, one of the most complex men who's probably ever lived, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who has one of the most outsized impacts ever on American history. And what's even more interesting about Johnson, it's not just about Johnson. It's about the times he lived in. He lived through World War II. He mm -hmm. came elected during the Great Depression. He uh, you know, was senator at the time of the segregation of South and knew all of the players involved. And then ultimately, mm -hmm. he beat them. So it's like you learn so much about the actual dynamics. And why, the reason I like it is because I like to know how stuff actually happened, not what we like to say happened. So how, power, say, how power happens. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that is the, the history of power. You know, somebody actually told me this. I don't want to get in too much trouble, but uh, I think that the big, and I, I'm just reiterating what he said, which is that the biggest problem today is that history is solely the history of the oppressed mm -hmm. instead of the history of power. And prior to the 1960s, the way that we understood history, basically from Greco-Roman times up until then, was to learn the history of power. Oh, if you look at Machiavelli, if you look at the classic historical texts of the reason and the way that the Europeans would study the Mongols, and even how the Mongols would study their own people and their own history, it was all about power. Now, of course, learning the history of the oppressed actually informs the history of power. And so there's, you know, obviously I'm not saying that shouldn't be studied, but what I'm saying is we have not learned, we have lost a lot of that knowledge and of even those pathways of trying to understand something that actually carries over to the way that I would cover Trump, which is, I was like, you know, covering this controversy actually misses the point as to what's actually going to happen with this piece of legislation, which would impact millions of people. Mm -hmm. So trying to understand things through that lens and then bring that both to my coverage and to more. I think that's the single most important series ever written. I mean, listen, Washington is not that different. The Senate was actually designed to basically work the same from the very beginning. Anytime I see people here, uh, um, you know, complaining about dysfunction, I'm like, oh, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you don't know anything. <laughs> the LBJ books I find fascinating yeah. because, um, you know, LBJ was not a, you know, like a naturally gifted speaker yeah. or, you know, um, or it's kind of an outsized personality in the way you might think of, say, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. But, you know, if you read the books, the way he accumulates power, the way he organizes, you know, the young people, you know, mm -hmm. in Congress. Mm -hmm. And then there's a phrase, which I think in the, in the book, which I and others have used it to describe other people we know in our world is he was a great professional son yes. to multiple oh, yeah. people. And I think great. when you read the book, even if you don't care about politics or presidential history, you can then map it to people you know in technology or business or media or whatever. You're like, oh, this person is doing that. All hierarchical institutions are the same. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, you know, for all the window dressing, there's a guy at the top, there are managers, there are accesses to power. Mm -hmm. That's all that mostly matters. Those people are, you know, outsized impact on the rest of the institution and on your life. And if you're working within that institution, it would behoove you if you want power in that institution to understand how that works. Reading those books to me is a lesson of life. It's like, uh, I mean, you know, Arthi, you were telling me about hustle. I mean, mm -hmm. all I could think about at the white house is I was like, Johnson was getting up earlier than me. You know, he was working harder. Then I, I tell myself that all the time. I'm like, anytime I'm tired or I complain, I mean, there's a line Sri Ram in the book that he reiterates. If you do everything, then you will win. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly right, which is that everything I've ever done 
uh, launching breaking points. Anything that went wrong, it really wasn't that bad because we had I had sat there and obsessed. I mean, people think that this is all effortless, but I like to say that if you're really good at television, for every one minute that you speak, it takes 30 minutes of preparation or reading, right. oh, yeah. which is that right. what it means is that for every minute and for the five minutes that it would take for me to articulate to everybody why they should read the Lyndon Johnson books, it took, I don't know, 170 hours of listening to those books over and over and over again. And then all the accoutrement of like all these books behind me that you read that you can put together and synthesize and then try to make it digestible for people. Mm -hmm. Like that's so, the, what I actually think is my skill. So we talked about LBJ, pick another president that you've tried to learn life lessons from. I think Teddy Roosevelt, I think is of another course, favorite of yours, actually, but what's another Grant. president? Uh, Grant, actually, I love Grant. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite books, the Ron Chernow book on Grant. The reason I tell everybody to read it is in the life of a single man, you get to learn about the Mexican War, about the pre-Civil War U.S. Army, the American Civil War, the uh, actual high politics and strategy of the Lincoln administration in the waning days, Reconstruction, and then the Gilded Age. You name me a single other book where you can get all of that. Also, one of the most tenacious, mm -hmm. interesting, humble, stupid individuals who ever lived, all rolled into one, a deeply complex interesting figure who is also forgotten by history. You know, everybody loves TR. Listen, I love TR too. I mean, there's, there's a certain majesty to certain individuals, JFK. I mean, I've got, uh, mm -hmm. why England slept behind me. That's actually, that's one of was published in 1939 when, when JFK was only 23 years old. I mean, there are certain individuals who are just capture the magic, but there are a lot of great individuals too, who never captured that and who deserve just as much interest. I think Grant is one of those figures, John Adams, you know, David McCullough just died. Mm. Yeah, or I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, they, titan. yesterday, yeah. So it's oh, man, a titan, and I have I have so many of his books. I mean, so many of his books had such a major impact on me. The Wright brothers. I mean, that was one of those books which I just oh, that just blew me away. The history of flight. And yeah. I went to Paris actually because of the Wright brothers because I was reading it, and then I read another book that uh, Americans in Paris is a fantastic exactly. Book. I read yeah. that book, and I was like, wow, I need to go to Paris. Didn't have the same experience, <laughs> but uh, I just had to go. I was like, there's this connection, you know, between. Yeah. young Americans in Paris. And I was like, I just had to go see it for myself. And like, imagine Orville Wright sitting on a bench, you know, in the, in the, in the guard. I don't know. I, I had to go see it with my own eyes. I can't really explain why I just had to. Do you worry that the next generation is just losing the ability to just read and mm -hmm. get information through reading? I don't know. I mean, people say that all the time, right? Which yeah. is that amusing ourselves to death was written in like 1995. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody said television would be that. I grew up in television. I was fine. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that a certain personality set and a certain condition of people's lives will always make them gravitate towards consuming information. I will confess, I don't read as much as I used to, yeah. but that's because I just love listening to podcasts. Right. The amount of contemporary information that right. you can get on pot is amazing. Amazing. Yep. And like for me, this is the, I mean, I have a bias. I'm an auditory learner. I listen at 1.5, 2.5, three times, mm -hmm. five speed, Damn. depending on, so I can pack in so many hours of information in a single day. And I can't even describe to people how beneficial that is mm -hmm. to my life. And we're living in such exciting times. I can get cutting edge health information from our friend, Andrew Huberman. Yep. He could record it two days ago and it's in my brain, you know, and the study was published, I don't know, two weeks ago. Yeah. Like, that's amazing yep. to me. Yep. The other person I think you turned me on to is uh, more plates, more dates. Oh it's, yeah, uh, Derek. You know, I, I Derek. Of, it, it, explain that channel because I think <laughs> when I first started, I was like, okay, but then you get into it and you're like, okay, this is actually it, it's oh, yeah. on the same axis as Huberman. Bingo. Derek is a uh, he's a fascinating figure. So I'm also fascinated by fitness and bro culture. I started lifting weights a couple of years ago. Um, something is really looking happened. good, Sagar. Looking good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Just got back from the gym actually, and. I have been, I'm just very interested in this subculture because there are millions of men who this is all they care about. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know, the content of that industry, I, I think I'm interested in areas which are ignored by the mainstream. So for example, and by the way, I get it. I get why iron, the iron gym and meathead culture is never going to be amenable to mass advertising and to Hollywood. But millions of people are interested in it. So I'm interested in it. I'm like, what's mm -hmm. happening here? And I'm also actually genuinely interested in the material. Derek is a fascinating figure who genuinely has no scientific training whatsoever. And somehow 
through his own self-knowledge and reading, has become one of the world's foremost like science communicators. And I may that that may sound crass to people who know who he is who work in the scientific field, but given his level of audience, I'm talking about millions and millions of people. A lot of folks learn about endocrinology, about testosterone, about uh, what lifts and what not to do, about mm -hmm. why certain celebrities look the way that they do. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I mean, it's undeniable. It, it is undeniable that this guy sitting in front of basically a setup like this through the sheer information in his brain has amassed in one of the biggest fitness audiences. Without anyone seen. knowing his last name. Nobody uh, even knows who he is. Yeah, that's the most. I mean, nobody knew who he was five years ago. He wasn't even, he was barely posting videos three or four yeah. years ago. And he really only became prominent in the last two. So people like that absolutely fascinate me. Do you think that, you know, there's kind of like a, an axe or cluster of him, Jordan Peterson, Rogan, Jocko, which kind of speaks to, you know, maybe people looking for a new kind of masculinity, um, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, what is the role for men? Because they, there's kind of like something to unpack there. And I think a lot of these folks are maybe kind of like similar. You know, converging or have an, there. Yeah, converging yeah. or they have an overlap in the audience. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean, it's not a secret that all the people that you just mentioned have all appeared on each other's podcasts, right? I mean, Rogan right. is kind of a, the nexus. Yeah, I think that the simple answer is, is that masculinity and a celebration of it, and especially a celebration of explicitly masculine things. Like I go to an iron gym, you know, and there's like a Punisher thing on the side and like, American flags and like people are ripped up and stuff. And just, I'm sorry, like that doesn't exist in popular culture today. It's gone. I'm maybe it existed uh, in the 1990s. So there was some representation, but I mean, that's not a terrible thing because now it just exists on the internet and it exists online. So I think that that is the nexus for everything, but you know, it's not just that uh, Shuram. I'm interested in the whole nexus of people who intersect in this area of ignored by the establishment but have massive multi-million dollar businesses and millions of people. Like another example I always use is Steve Ranella, who owns the Meat Eater podcast. They are running an empire out mm -hmm. in, uh, I, I don't even know where it is, like Bozeman, Montana. We are mm -hmm. talking about the hunting and fishing and outdoor is obviously something that core to the American experience, right? And when I was growing up, it was not uncommon to see people with Bass Pro fishing shops and people were reading hunting magazines. Mm -hmm. That is all just like the internet disrupts everything. It eats the world, right? That has been eaten by media. They have subsumed all of outdoor and hunting media into this single entity under this personality who now hires and owns all of these people in these different verticals, huge YouTube shows, cooking shows, massive online presence, merchandise King. I'm talking multi, multi-million dollar this is, I don't think anybody even knows who he is. He recently mm. got a New York Times profile, right? But it recently just woke up to it. And I'm like, what? I mean, this is, this is, that's what is interesting to me. Stuff like that, which nobody else is paying attention to. Why do you think this, you know, there's also need to be like, I'm going to say some of these folks, if the mainstream media is going to think of them as being on the right, yes. which is kind of interesting because there's this whole, you know, first of all, you know, a lot of the people talk about are actually often not men, you know, they're kind of both genders and, you know, you look at them and they actually have like different political affiliations. Yeah. But there is, I think sometimes this impression that, okay, they are more on the right than the left, at least from, you know, if you got the kind of the, the canonical mainstream coverage, why do you think that is happening? Well, unfortunately, everything has just been coded establishment or non-establishment. And if you're establishment, then generally coded Democrat, Democrat, or at least left, quasi left, uh, or it's going to get coded right wing if you are antithetical to that. And mm -hmm. I think that's really sad because it doesn't really capture any of the ethos, you know, mm -hmm. behind it, which is, but that ultimate, I mean, look, at a certain point, you can't choose. You just do whatever you want to do and people are going to call you what they want. I have no issue, you know, with kind of with these. I mean, what, what annoys me about it is that I wish people who were of that more, establishment mind or others would just try and give some of it a chance because I think that the ideological veneers that get cast over people mask a lot of really good content. I mean, true. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just an average guy and you, you know, think Derek or whatever is like, Oh, that's right wing. Like you're missing out on a lot of really good information that will, could really help you mm -hmm. like that. That's what, that's why I actually, uh, I really don't like it because I actually do think, you know, outside of my own personal interests, I think there's a lot of people who get coded right wing who are not right wing 
at all. And frankly, are you know, it's a disservice to them and to a lot of their content. I loved Top Gun Maverick this summer. Me too. Oh. Um, you know, because I think that somehow seems to have resisted uh, the left wing right wing split i know you, you have thoughts on i saw that. your yeah i did a monologue on too. It. yeah on and uh, yeah i yeah. saw that whole monologue and you know i looked at the comments too and the first comment was something like this movie is straight out of a time ca- can time capsule in yes. a really good way you know yeah it's just like flying some really badass planes and having fun and there's no like cynicism and no yes. you know no irony about the whole thing and it just felt like really fresh but also yeah. kind of nostalgic yeah. for the 90s and 80s absolutely and a america wins b there are people of very diverse background skin color but it doesn't yeah. matter yeah, it, just, it's immaterial to the story fight. completely yes. immaterial to the story i still think about that little uh thing at the beginning when tom cruise comes on he's like real g's real planes thank you all for and he gives you the grin and yeah. i was oh man oh was, man yeah it's so yeah, good yeah. Yeah, so, so good, good. Um, we love the movie. We went to watch it. Like, you know, we have kids and stuff, so it's really hard oh, to like, you know, schedule the whole thing. But we watched it like back to back, like two nights in oh, a row, so which so is good. really, really yeah. good. And, you know, I think for us, we talk a lot about, you know, in with tech companies and tech startups, uh, we have previous guests, we've had like Mark Andreessen come in and talk about this and Brian Armstrong from Coinbase mm-hmm. talk about this on just wokeness and political activism at work kind of thing. Um, you know, in the same range as like Top Gun and you talked about wokeness, what does that mean to you as such? Yeah, I mean, let's, I don't think it would surprise anyone to say I'm an opponent of wokeness. Uh, I, I, Hold the press. Is, yeah, yeah. is it a thing that people can do anymore? I don't know. Unfortunately, probably the thing I am best known for. You know, that actually really annoys me. I don't want to be best known for being anti-woke. I would much rather be best known as the guy who likes nuclear power and semiconductors. But What are your pronouns, Sagar? Yeah, well, I mean, beyond that, it's just, I mean, I, look, it drives me crazy, no question. And I mean, there is just something so corrupting about it. I think maybe, look, maybe, and this could be an old thing. I genuinely remember when I was living in a country which was very confident in itself, optimistic about itself. I loved the way that we were actually taught early American history of like this hopeful story about the pioneers and all that. And I actually, I'm going to just say something controversial. I thought in the 90s, they actually did a decent enough job of, yes, we had slaves and yes, all the Indians were killed. And this, we didn't live up to the, you know, the ideals of the American Revolution or the Civil War, but we've done our best in order to move to this place where somebody like Sagar and Jetty can sit here and identify as an American as a five-year-old. Like, I mean, that was actually, that's a nice story. And I believed in that story. And I mean, the irony is, is that unless you've been corrupted by higher institution, most people who come to this country still believe in believe in that. Yeah, your story is super interesting because yeah. if nobody knew what you do now, they would think that a brown kid in Texas post 9-11, I'm sure you experience like, you know, some racist stuff out there. Definitely. Um, you know, but here you are, you know, not not what people would think of the extremely left liberal. So that's actually a very interesting journey yeah i mean i think i look i think what it is is that i was sympathetic to that and then i came to washington dc and i saw those ideas fully not ideas i saw that orientation fully in practice and i was like yeah this isn't really what i am at all i'm like i'm not just here to like like indulge in grievance politics and you know also i mean i hate to say this but there's obviously a deep class element to it which is that look my parents were indian professors and a lot of these kids were like poor and a lot of them you know, a lot of them don't have a lot of education and I, you know, I'm not excusing it, but I'm like, I get it. You know, I can look at an, here's the thing. I can look at another country and be like, yeah, that no shit that's going to happen in this country. So then you just are able to look at your country and be like, okay, well, there's a lot going on here. It's multifaceted. And I mean, really what it was is that the, when I saw the idea of the United States start to get attacked, that is really where I started to turn and probably mm-hmm. became probably more partisan than, I should have, you know, it's interesting. I, I was one of the OG critics. I don't get any credit for this of the 1619 project. It was like me and like two other people, um, who were, I was like, listen, this is dangerous. And I don't, I don't want to invite too much controversy on your show, Shriram, but I'll give a, I'll give a case for it, which is that <laughs> my it's belief too late for that, <laughs> my, even flagged. Good. my belief at that time was that And I saw what was happening, which is that they paired with the Pulitzer Institute so that they could teach Mm -hmm. this in schools, was that they were attacking that narrative that I just laid out 
you know, that I learned in school and which fundamentally was also untrue. So it's both false, but mm -hmm. also is one that undermines a deep and important idea at the heart of, I think, any optimistic immigrant experience mm. yes. of which only somebody who comes here and then chooses to identify as American can truly understand. And that's why I felt it so viscerally, why I really, you know, I, like I said, became one of these people who's like probably predominantly known as anti-woke, but it's because I think that battle is important. I think it truly divides people in such a way, which is just so antithetical to why I love living here. I mean, mm -hmm. look, I've had the privilege of living and traveling all around the world. And I can just tell people out there, I'm like, you don't know how good. Like I lived in a Muslim theocracy in yeah. Qatar. Okay. Like oh. we've got a good life. <laughs> can I, can I, uh, Actually, yeah. I want to quote one of your tweets to you, but before <laughs> yes. that, uh, oh, you know, like before that, I want to say, yeah. uh, I don't think Athena talk about this in the show, uh, but when we grew up in India, and if you've not been there, it's such a different world and context from what people here can yes. imagine. Right. We really believed in the American dream, right? We believed you come here, you work hard, you know, and then maybe you get to like run up the stairs in Philadelphia, and maybe you know you can win a boxing match, but you kind of really believed yeah. in that, and I think that idea that it doesn't matter what your skin color is or what language you speak, whether you have an accent, you know, you show up, you know, you show up in New York City or you show up in LA, you work your butt off, you can, you can make something yourself, right? There was kind of a purity to that. Oh, so uh, which... We used to look up to people like, you know, Steve Jobs and we'd be like, well, you know, we have a shot at that. Like, we yeah. could, like come to Silicon Valley and work at a company and, you know, build a startup. And we're just as good as like anybody else. If you have the talent for it and you could work hard enough. And it was never in question or in doubt, like nothing else really mattered, which I think a lot of people forget, you know, unless you're like an immigrant who's like coming here, you, you don't, you know, one of my friends, he's going to be a citizen, U.S. citizen in a couple of weeks, you know, years and years of living in the U.S., but he's finally like made it. And he, you know, I spoke to him yesterday and he talked about how even the worst case scenario for the U.S. is better than the best case scenario Absolutely. in a lot of places, in a lot of countries. And you just tend to forget that when you get caught up in this, you know, cycle of just toxic conversations. Yeah, I know. I mean, I say things like, which I'll get in trouble for, I'll be like, you know, no country on earth has done more to atone for its racial sins, the United States. And people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, you know, Portugal invented the slave trade. I'm like. Have you, do you see them talking about it? They literally memory hole it. They don't talk about it at all. Um, mm -hmm. Like all, how about Spain? Ever heard of the conquistadors? Yeah. I've been to South America. You know, like, do you think that factors into Spanish politics? Like they just pretend it literally does not exist. Let me quote you one of yeah. the tweets. I had this in my Go ahead. talk because okay. Sagar and Jerry on June 27th, Europe is substantially poorer, more racist, True. less dynamic, and much less free than the US. Food is bland, True. coffee tastes like shit. The weather True. is mostly awful. Their primary culture export is tourism, and they have less say in the affairs of the world. Wow. All true. Tell me I'm wrong. I mean, look, the coffee one is debatable, <laughs> but I love American-style coffee. I love drip coffee. When I am in Europe, and they just give you an espresso, I'm like, I just want a full cup of coffee. Like, I would literally rather be at a 7-Eleven and get one of those jumbos with hazelnut or whatever. No milk. Hold no, on. It's fine. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Hey, this, let's, God, you don't realize I'm, I'm, that I'm Starbucks. I'm actually with you on that. Like, uh, yeah. All I want is like a mug, like a big yeah, mug of coffee. Big. Like black hey, coffee. I'm in Europe. I'm not going to be the guy who walks into a Starbucks. I'm ha not. Have you heard that. people who'd be like, oh, it's espresso. You could just have yeah. hot water to it. And no, it like it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> the same. <laughs> you do realize Starbucks basically, you know, they what? brought the concept from Italy, from okay, Europe. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. They brought the coffee culture from italy and frappuccino the american coffee is a long mainstay actually i read a little bit about this it's kind of interesting which <laughs> is that uh the american continent and i and american south american continent our coffee cultures are very similar so when i go to colombia or i go to panama they drink drip coffee and that mm -hmm. is where they they buy that is very much part of the similar experience of the boil of a kind of communal a lot of liquid espresso and all of that that really is what we imported from yeah. the europeans yeah. and that coffee culture is not i'm just honest it's not as enjoyable i also to me to me personally i like the taste i'm a big third wave coffee guy like i like you know the 
full Chemex and bre brew and all of that. Oh, so one that's of those definitely, people. yeah, I'm definitely one of those people, but here's the thing. Oh, I'll man. drink 7-Eleven too. I'll drink 7-Eleven too. Do you I, like I love time it. it? And you're like, well, Oh yeah. I've got the, the oh grams, goodness. ounces. I'm, I've unfortunately I've had to learn the, like, just give me the damn coffee. Like why yeah. are we, what are we waiting? <laughs> well, for? if you were, if you were to visit, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. But uh, yeah. I'm saying, I I just love American style coffee culture. I love sometimes I like going to a diner and just getting diner coffee. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Euro Euro coffee culture, not yeah. for me. Uh, in you, terms of the food, has you any guys, country oh, basically asked you to never show up there? <laughs> in you know, a lot of actually uh, that that got a lot of replies from like EU MPs and all those people. I mean, like this fool, American fool. Should never come to our country. I'm like, jokes on you. I have visa upon arrival in your shitty country because you need our nuclear umbrella. Sorry. Um, so uh, that's one of those things where. Uh, <laughs> you, you basically say, look, look at, go watch Peter Zion, right? Like, you need our Navy. Yeah, literally. I mean, it's like, what, you think this universal health care is free? I'm like, where do you think this comes from? Somebody pays I insult for your coffee, oh, but, yeah. you know, you need our Navy. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only reason to go to, look, I like Europe. It's a nice place to visit. That's what I would say. I, I see uh, a big butt coming at the end yeah. of this sentence. I could never live there. Uh, I love America. Everything about America that I love, I really can't get in Europe. I mean, look, I mean, the more racist point I made is unambiguously true if you are a person who is hmm. not white. I mean, I don't think most white Americans have any idea how racist Europeans yeah, are. I mean, I've been almost, I've probably been to 20 or 30 countries who, um, on the European continent. I mean, the most racism I've ever experienced is in Lithuania. Like, you know, that's probably not something also people true in parts hear. of Asia, by the way. Right? Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. yeah. But try being black in Japan. I uh, like. I would love for people to understand what it's like for, for people out there. But this is, you know, of course, this never translates onto our political system. Thus, it just becomes um, irrelevant and, and not discussed. But yeah, I mean, look, European food, I get it. If you have that type of palate, you guys will probably sympathize. I grew up in Texas and I'm Indian. So I have, I grew up with two of the most spice dense palates um, on the planet. I love Mexican. When I go to Paris, I don't eat French food. I can't do it. I go to eat Moroccan food because at least I, it's I got some flavor. French food is just, there's just meat. There's just a ton sure. of meat. And right. then you're I like, mean, meat what? is fine, but it's got some flavor. And just a little yeah. salt on here. I'm like, this is, I can't do you this. You just like dish out yeah. your like, you know, sriracha sauce and Sandra, okay. it. Look, let me, let me pitch you a project, right? Like okay. I want you to do an Anthony Bourdain style I know, people have told me show, this, yeah, but show. it's basically the idea is like, you just go in there with a the revulsion, right? You know, yeah, like, yeah. What is this? I can get a better thing at a diner, you know, on a highway. And you just kind of like, you know, yeah. you just play the stereotypical American. Yeah, and right? we just and like, cut like, back and forth. You're literally in like a gas station, 7-Eleven, you oh, know. I would love that. Yeah. You know, one idea I have is doing a one sip, everybody knows the rules, like a coffee review thing, like in lieu of Dave Portnoy. And just, but instead, just come out of just like 7-Eleven, be like one sip, everybody knows the rules, Wawa, hazelnut. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That Honestly, it might really do well. Real. It probably, probably actually would do uh, uh, That's actually a great idea. I've seen, <laughs> yeah. um, so for example, Portnoy does pizza. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you look at uh, Mike, who hangs out with Logan Paul, he does burgers. But yeah. I don't think anybody yeah. has done coffee. Yeah, that could be your thing. Yeah, and, and, and explicitly ignoring the actual like third wave coffee movement. Because, I mean, to be honest, in my personal life, I'm a huge coffee snob. Like when I go to New York, I'm balling out. Like I'm going to every one of these crazy places where they have all this limited edition Japanese beans or oh, yeah. whatever. But I, like I said, I love American coffee. I will go to a diner in Denny's in the middle of wherever, and I'm, I'll enjoy the hell out of it in the morning. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, this show, Sagar, make it happen. There's going to be a thing, right? Uh, Sagar <laughs> travels the world. Um, so, okay. It, it, we kind of like to ask these very deep philosophical questions, which is um, if you had advice for young people, because a lot of our audience happens to be very young, very and young. a lot of our audience also happens to be Indian, and I think you are interested in so many things, right? Like, you know, you come from Indian heritage, you know, you uh, rejected the mainstream, you're obviously killing it uh, online, you're going to soon have a hit travel show if you follow our advice. Uh, but seriously, though, you know, what if you have somebody who's 14, 16, 19, watching this, what advice would you have for them? What I understood at a very young age, I think, actually, my mom tells me this story. My mom told me that when I was 18, that she sat me down and she said, okay, Sagar, what job are you going to have? And I said, if you're asking about a job, you're asking the wrong question. 
And so I think what I intuited is that the world was changing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is a stereotypical answer, but I think the world ebbs and flows between institutional power and non-institutional power. Mm -hmm. I think that we are in one of those institutional breakdowns, which the internet is everything. So mm -hmm. as a child of the internet, I think of myself as somebody who bet on that. And what I would say is study the, you know, the medium is the message. So study the medium of which mm -hmm. uh, you are familiar. Like if you are in fitness right now, and if you are not posting online, you are not going to make it. And or you are not going to make it to the top of your industry. You may be a local thing or whatever, but you will not be a major quote unquote influencer. And actually, even at this point, you know, a lot of that is changing. So I would deeply study the environment, the trends, and then try, try to use history to inform about where those things are going. History has been my greatest friend, my greatest teacher. Uh, there's an apocryphal Mark Twain quote. Nobody actually knows if he said it or not, which is that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Whether it's true, whether he said it or not, it's a great quote. And mm -hmm. I think about it all the time. When I think about lineage, there are immutable lessons that you can learn about power, about how to get ahead, about, I mean, I've read about 90% of the presidential biographies behind me. I mean, there is a uniting thing with all of them, which is that actually most of them just worked their asses off and mm -hmm. worked off, worked much harder than most people in this world will ever work at anything. And then they did it year after year after year after year. And there's a lot of sacrifice with that. That was mm -hmm. another thing, you know, that I've learned. I've, you know, I read before I started Breaking Points, I read so many books on the history of television. I would read about the creation of Fox News, about the creation of cable. Um, Cause I was like, if I'm gonna be antithetical to something, I need to understand how it even happened in the first place. Brian Stelter's book on morning show and the culture and all of that. So I, I, my only advice is familiarize yourself deeply with something that uh, you are passionate about. And by doing so, I think that you can use those lessons for your own benefit should the time come. Even tech, uh, I've read hell of a lots of, the early histories of tech. It's so interesting to me. I mean, beyond mm -hmm. just like the normal, like Steve Jobs, there's that book, like how the internet happened. Oh, yeah. uh, that, mm -hmm. I forget exactly. What One of the book. best things about actually hang on with Mark and Reason is the oh, history he's so part. well read. Oh my God. Yeah. He's so well read. So annoyingly well read. Um, Come with you like a freight train. Like it's yeah. not just the reading, it's also his recollection, just oh, being able amazing. to quote like random passages, random you know, I'd be like, oh, yeah, in that book, he says, he uses this word. And you're like, yeah. or yeah. you say that thinking, aha, I got you. Yeah. And he'd be he'd like counter you being like, yeah. And then he like follows on yeah. with this other thing. And you're like, how do you have this great memory? Right. And underneath, there's a layer of like, he was there, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's always the background. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe final question, which is, uh, let's fast forward 60, 70, 80 years, maybe you know, like 90, 100 years, you follow all of Huber, Huberman's advice. So it's like 100 years in the future. And you're looking back, uh, what would you want to have accomplished or done for you to just feel really happy? I think uh, what I really enjoy the most is distilling concepts to the most basic form to people who I think are struggling. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the stuff that I get the most gratification from, and I'm quoting from them. I mean, I said it, it's a heavy thing, but it really is true. I mean, I met this guy and he was like, you really helped my relationship with my dad. You know, you contextualized some of the things that he's going through in his life and that would then manifest. And I, I, I understood it better and I don't argue as much and you know, things like that, that, that is just, it means the world to me. So I really, really enjoy helping people who are struggling. And I think a lot of people in this country are struggling unjustly. So I think I've gotten extraordinarily lucky, both my heritage and uh, what's happened to me. I really like just making their lives maybe like 1% better because I, I know what it means to, to many of those people. Um, I meet people all the time, Uber drivers, hotel clerks, people who are struggling, people who just got laid off or whatever. They're like, Hey, you know, I really appreciate your show. And like, that's, that's why I do it. I, I love doing that. So I'm just going to continue with that. Wow. Incredible. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I love it, man. You know, I just want to say, you know, Sagar, you know, behind the suit wearing persona that, you know, he portrays is a, Incredibly smart, incredibly well-read, slightly snobbish about coffee, 
Yes. Uh, you know, not but, exactly. But also like really warm, very empathetic, really wants to help. You know, it's Thank true. You guys. Like, it means it means a lot. Things. It really does. I love both your show. I mean, I love your guys' show. I've I've watched a lot of the episodes. Uh, I'm a fan uh, as thank well. You. And you guys are too kind. And look, I'm always here to do anything I possibly can to help. So thank you so much. Well, I'm only saying this because you sent me the book. Oh, well, <laughs> well, see, it works. You know, that's a Johnson move. That's a Johnson move. That's really? part of why I sent it. Yeah, of course oh. it did. Oh, yeah. Always into it what somebody knows and wants the most and then give it to them without them asking. All right. Oh, wow. my God. Wow. Okay. That, awesome. uh, uh, that might be the good note. In it. Man, Sagar, this was a blast. Oh, my Great. goodness. I'm glad, Thank I'm you glad it was so, good. so, so much. I loved it. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys.